Patrick, thank you so much for coming and, and being a part of our show. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's such a treat. I've known your work for a long, long time. And uh, I'm not surprised that you found yourself collaborating with some of the most special people, including His Holiness the Dalai Lama recently, because your work has such goodness in it and such beauty in it. And it, it talks about some of the most simple truths. Um, but I want to go back to the beginning. Um, how you you yourself started on your creative path. Like what was the first spark that led you to to know that maybe you would go into this world later on in your life? Oh, but you know that that's funny you should use the word spark because uh, my journey started when I was probably around four or five. And uh, I grew up in the 60s, so I was totally uh, in love with peanuts. <laughs> Me too. And peanuts was done by Charles Schultz, and all his friends called him Sparky. That's where the spark comes in. That's so interesting. And, uh, you know, peanuts was my religion as a kid. I read those books every night before I went to bed. And uh, ever since I was a little kid, I just wanted to be a cartoonist and um, give back all the comfort and joy that I got from uh, Sparky Strip. And that just, you know, that, that was my dream as a little kid to do that. And it did, uh, I was lucky enough that the dream came true. I went to art school. Uh, I didn't immediately did comic strips. I, when I got out of art school, I was doing magazine illustrations. I worked for New York Times and Sports Illustrated, but I knew I wanted to do a cartoon. And when I finally got a dog, uh, a little Jack Russell named Earl, I thought he would be the great, a good star for a comic strip. And I started my strip, which became the combination of my love for comics and my love for uh, animals. And uh, that's so much happened. And I was been doing much now for 29 years. And, uh, you know, through much, um, I was trying to draw my comic from the eyes of the animals. So when I started really thinking about the animals on this planet and realizing how tough a lot of them have it, you know, I think they really brought out a lot of compassion and empathy in me. And that became the focus point of the strip. And uh, I've been lucky enough to work with Eckhart Tolle on a book called Guardians of Being. And I was lucky enough to uh, work on a, a children's book about Jane Goodall as a young girl. And uh, and now I'm lucky enough, I'm just, just a, it is a, you said you weren't surprised, but it, it's a surprise <laughs> to me that I got to work with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. It's all just so beautiful and radiant and yummy and it's so lovely. Um, let's talk more about the essence of what you just said that that the the the, the comic turned into really compassion being a theme. I mean, I just feel like that's the biggest deficit we have in the world. It's not money, it's compassion. Um, let's talk about that. What is it that you've been wanting to communicate all these years? What has been resonating um, along those lines of compassion? What, it, what is it that you want your audience to understand about that? Well, you know, with me, it, um, you know, again, I'll go back to peanuts. I mean, there was so much kindness in that strip um, and just art, how much, and, and, you know, the other thing for me is, you know, making art is a form of meditation. And um, so that, you know, that was my happy place. And with the animals, you know, with, when I got my dog, girl, I wanted a dog my whole life because of Snoopy, but I didn't get him until I was in my thirties. And uh, just all that unconditional love that dog had. And I said, you know, if I'm going to do a strip, that has to be such a big part of the strip because, you know, that special bond everyone has with their pets. I wanted that to be a big part of the strip. And, and that bond is love and you know, compassion. So, uh, I knew that was going to be the message of this strip. And then I got lucky that um, the Humane Society of the United States saw my strip and they asked me to be on their board of directors. And that just opened up the scope. You know, then I learned how tough it is for, you know, farm animals and animals in the wild and just how crazy the world is. And that, you know, opened up my strip to talk about some of those subjects too, that, you know, we need to be compassionate for all the beings on the planet. Oh, it's all so beautiful. Um, you know, it's one thing to have 
an incredible intention, but it's another thing to see it land, right? And there's a lot of beautiful people with a lot of talent and and goodness, and they don't always have the same level of success, right? It's um, it's something um, else entirely when the world receives it and it it goes viral, so to speak, right? People really take to it. What was the turning point where you saw that this thing you were creating was really grabbing hold of people's hearts in some real visceral way? Why do you think, why do you think it's been so successful? Like, what do you think is happening with your readers that makes this what it really is? Well, you know, I think it's because of that special bond we have with our pets. You know, my readers are, have a cat or a dog or both or everything else they could have. And um, I hopefully they connect to how Earl and Ozzy's relationship and we just love our pets. And, that, and that's how I worked. That's how the book I did, Guardians of Being with Eckhart Tolle uh, happened. I'm, I'm sure people are familiar with Eckhart Tolle. He wrote a, an incredible book called The Power of Now, which really spoke to me. Incredible. And I, yeah. And I just became, I became a big fan and started listening to all his tapes and reading all his, you know, books. And um, you know, part of one of the things that uh, I related to with Eckhart that he, he used nature and animals and even our pets in particular, as he calls them guardians of being, that our pets help us get into the present moment. You know, if a cat's on your lap purr and it's hard to think about your troubles, you're with the cat. And same with your dog, you're out throwing the ball with the dog, you're, you're not thinking about all the, all the troubles in the world. So um, I started collecting his quotes about dogs and cats and then animals in particular and uh, started putting some of my scripts with the, these quotes and I thought it could make for a nice book and I got lucky that my um, agent um, was able to get in touch with Eckert and uh, he uh, Eckert liked the idea and we got to do the Guardians of Being book uh, together. It's so true what you're saying. I have four Persian cats and one of one of them was just here. Uh, I say that he looks like a Jim Henson creature. He's so cute um, and so unconditional. And yes, it's so true. Like whenever any of them are around and they're purring. And I even was reading recently that the frequency of a cat's purr, it's so coherent. There's something in that frequency that like mm-hmm. literally puts you in the rhythms of your own presence. Um, It drops you into that energy, which is really powerful. And cats also, I know I'm riffing on cats for a second, but I also just was reading like cats feel the energy before the person walks in the room. They can like, that's why they kind of, you know, dogs are like that too. I don't know, but they feel it. Like they really get you grounded because if you walk over to a dog or a cat and you're not coming from something that feels like peace, they're not going to be not going to go along for the ride you know they're they're witnessing not what you're saying but how you're being yeah no they're they're in the now and um so i think with my comic strip people could relate to their own cats and dogs and people let down their guards when that happens i mean i see it all the time if i ever have to go to a, a business meeting if you ask even the toughest guy in the meeting or gal in the meeting about their pet at home they light say, up oh my <laughs> everything changes the world becomes free and happy all of a sudden so that's just I think the magic of animals so I think I can reach people because they let their guards down and they're in that happy animal mode and um you know and it was you know I I don't want it to be preachy but it became easier and you know and the comic strip is such a strange funny medium you know people read it every day, usually in the morning, and it becomes part of your, like you feel those characters are part of your family. I mean, it's, so it's more of like a conversation around the breakfast table. So I was able to, I think, you know, talk about some tougher animal issues, but in a more pleasant family way. That, yeah. um, and then again, people have their guard down with, with art and comics and uh, it's a, it's a magical um yeah. I mean, you see that in Peanuts, you know, all the, all the topics that Charles Schultz, you know, t- you know, spoke of in a quiet, kind way. It's, 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 a, it's a, definitely a unique 
artistic medium. Yeah. I always say that everything is synchronicity all the time. If you're, if you're in the flow with yourself, you know, things sort of echo back. And of course, yesterday, what did I take my kids to see yesterday? You're a good man, Charlie Brown. Yesterday. <laughs> um, so what were, what were we playing in the car on the way to school? Happiness. That's what we were playing. Um, so of course, you know, it would be like the entree to this conversation. What, what did it mean to you that you wound up connecting with him in your life, Charles Schultz, and that he wound up finding such value in your work? That must have been like a, like a surreal moment. It's, you know, it's, it's, you really realize life's a dream. I mean, it's so, it's so big and so small at the same time. Um, you know, when I did get to meet uh, Charles Schultz, um, you know, I showed him the strip wasn't in the newspapers yet. I actually showed him my initial drawings and he really liked them. And I, I felt like that was it. I was done. I didn't even have to put them in the newspaper. Charles Schultz liked them. And uh, he actually helped name, you know, I wasn't sure what to name the dog in my strip. And he was based on my own dog girl, but I thought he needed a funny cartoon name. But uh, Sparky said, name him after your own dog. And uh, I thought he might know what he's talking about. So I took his advice. <laughs> But no, he was, uh, and, he was, and Charles Schultz was everything you want Charles Schultz to be. Just, you know, you, you knew he was the guy who drew peanuts. He just had all that warmth and all that humor in him. It's so moving. And I know a little bit about his history and the fact that, you know, he had the history he had and still wanted to just talk about kindness and put that in the world is it's like, he's such a hero, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I, it says so much about you that of all the people in the world, you chose him as the person you wanted to most emulate, you know, that says so much about your goodness. And from such a young age, you kind of recognize kindness and wanted to put that in the world says so much about you. And it takes so much courage to show someone like Charles Schultz, your drawings before they're even out there. Like that, that says a lot about your own ego and where you were able to overcome that it's awesome. And uh, for somebody, we're going to go more into the depth of what's been in some of these books and, and the most recent ones. But before we do, I'm just curious for somebody who wants you as a mentor, for somebody who wants to do this, to be an illustrator, to write, make comics, what piece of um, guidance or advice would you have for maybe possibly having an ounce of your success? Um, but you know, it, it, it's it's real tough nowadays. I mean, I wanted to be a newspaper cartoonist and it's tough to tell kids today to be a newspaper cartoonist with the right. state of newspapers. But, you know, the art of words and pictures is never going to go away. That's so, right. you know, between graphic novels and there's still cartoons online and, and, and that, that form of medium, I think, if anything, it's getting bigger. I mean, I, you know, images are so important nowadays. Uh, you know, people are definitely reading less, but they definitely like their images. So it's there will always be a, you know, a home and a, a place to to express yourself with words and pictures. And my advice is just the old advice everyone's always given is like, you know, just be true to yourself. You know, to um, and the other thing is, how can you serve the world? You know, what do you what are you here for? It's you know, how how do you how can you serve the world? What what art can you do that's going to help? especially nowadays, I think that's more important than ever. And art helps. I mean, I, I think it's, you know, it's uh, humanity at its best at, when, it, when it is at its best. I love that so much. We had this man here, Dr. James Doty, he wrote this book called Into the Magic Shop. He's a neurosurgeon. He also works with the Dalai Lama on a big project and just wrote a book with him also. And he, he said, magic is real. And when you have a goal or an intention that at its core is designed to serve the whole world. It's mm -hmm. amazing how quickly those goals get reached. It's like when you cut your finger and immediately your body goes into repair, it's like the world is designed to conspire to help when what you're doing is to help. And I think we lose sight of that. And I, I love that you are such a torch of that. And your work well, is, is really an extension of that. So obviously. Well, you know, that, that's the, uh, the main point His Holiness makes in the new book, The Heart to Heart, that he's asking for a compassionate revolution, that, you know, we have the power to change all this. We just have to uh, get our hearts and minds in the right place. 
And it's such a simple message, but it's just crazy how it's so hard for humans to do, you know, just be kind. A hundred percent. And it's, you know, we get caught in this like amygdala, you know, in this part of our brain that puts us into like fight or flight. And then everything is another as opposed mm-hmm. to oneness, right? So it's all separateness and that's the biggest illusion of all. And, you know, I have a meditation practice that I've developed since like 2007. Do you have a practice in your own life of, you seem like you're very palpably present. Do you have some kind of a practice that you do that helps you open you your know, heart? I do uh, meditate um, not every morning. I was better at it. I've, I've been a little busy sort of <laughs> uh, missing some of my practice. But you know what I really do believe is, uh, like I, I, I mentioned before, I, I think making arts a meditation. I a hundred percent is true. You know, I think most of my day, I'm not here. <laughs> you know, I'm, uh, I'm uh, in the moment making the art. It's 100% true. I mean, they're even saying now that the data completely shows that if you're coloring, you know, or and this is why we see monks making mandalas, right? I mean, there's mm-hmm. there's there's a level of presence that it's uncanny, you know, if you're sketching, that's it, man. You're in the flow zone. So <laughs> yeah, that's I, funny. I I've I've said that I think, you know, when you do a daily comic strip, that that's a lot of art. And uh, I always compared us to monks illuminating manuscripts. You know, we just sit there all day and get to work, do the work. This yeah, is a it's, constant deadline. It's incredible. Let's talk about some of these beautiful books. You, you just mentioned the newest one, which we'll go into in a second. But um, The Gift of Nothing. Tell us about that book and what, what did the readers really take away from that? What does that even mean? I love that title, The Gift of Nothing. What does that mean? You know, that that's my first children's book. And it was actually based on a two-week story I did in Mutz. And it was a simple story of it was uh, the holiday season. And Mooch wanted to give Earl, his best friend, a gift. But, you know, Earl's the dog. And Mooch know he had a bowl and he had a chewy toy and he had a bed. So what else? He had everything. There was nothing else to get him. And uh, then he said, well, if, I, if he has everything, I'll get him nothing. And he, the, in the book, he searches to like, where do you find nothing in this crazy world uh, where there's so many somethings he couldn't find nothing anywhere until he finally went on his cat bed and got quiet and kind of did a meditation and started purring and realized he found nothing. And then he put it, he figured um, he'd put it in a box and put a bow around it. So he gives Earl this box that at the holiday and uh Earl opens it up and said there's nothing here which says nothing but me and then the two of them hug and it's uh I think it's a, it was a good gift that at the holiday season where we, we you know it's all about consuming but it's really about giving to each other my god I'm like totally weeping <laughs> it's um oh it's so beautiful you know it's like what do people want from you your presence your attention yeah that's the best gift you could give and uh, you know i had the pleasure to do a children's musical of it at the kennedy center in washington in washington dc oh my god that's so amazing who wrote the music um a guy named andy mitten and uh it was really and i and i wrote and it was directed by another great director named aaron posner and um what was fun is like in talking to the director, it was important to me that at some point in the play where Mooch gets on his bed to, to meditate and find nothing, that we were going to have a minute of silence. And he was like, you can't do a minute of silence. in a yeah, kid's That's a play. long time. Yeah. <laughs> but, that's you cool. know, we did it. And the actor was so good. He wanted the kids to join in the find nothing. And you I mean, during the whole play, kids, I mean, this was for like five, six year olds. So during the whole play, it was just pandemonium. But in that in that 30 seconds minute, they all really did get quiet. It was amazing. And at one performance, a kid stood up and screamed, I found nothing. <laughs> so uh, that, that was a, a, fun, a fun play to do. I love that so much. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Um, I've done all kinds of different meditation retreats and things like that, but in the last few years, my favorite meditation is going to the place 
in my own consciousness where I'm nobody mm-hmm. and, I'm not, and I'm nothing and I'm <laughs> no one and I'm in no time and I'm no I'm nowhere you know because our souls that's it there's no yeah. body they're not a body and they're nowhere and they're no time and there's nothing and it's the most it, it's the f- most full feeling it doesn't feel like nothing it really feels like something you know because you're not an ego and I mean that's just so beautiful um let's talk about this newest book a little bit more first of all what was that like for you to work with him on a project I mean it must also to use the word surreal it just must be what a gift for him to be with you because you're so genuine and what a gift for you to be with someone like that and however many meetings it was whether it was four or 12 or months I don't know but what do you feel you gained just in the process of working with him oh my well uh just to be living with those words. Uh, and that, you know, that was probably the ultimate meditation. I mean, the, I, it's the first time, you know, I was doing much for 28 years without a vacation, really. And uh, I took a six month sabbatical. So it was six months so I could just stay in that head and, and stay in that world. And uh, yeah, no, it, it was powerful. You know, and unfortunately what happened was, I'll tell you how the book got started, but it, it actually got started in Africa believe it or not. And um, I used to be on the board of the Humane Society of the United States. And um, a, one of my board members planned a trip with his friends to go to Africa and uh, invited my wife, Karen, and I to go. So we went and there. We met his wife, Pam, who sits on the board of the International Campaign for Tibet. And one night we were under the stars talking about how fragile and beautiful Africa was. And she started talking about this holiness, the Dalai Lama, and how, you know, the environment is such a strong part of his message now. And she knew my work, and she particularly liked the book I did with Eckhart Tolle. And my wife said, well, maybe Patrick can do a book with his holiness like he did with Eckhart Tolle. And she said, that's a great idea. And she brought it to the board when she came back. And the board presented to the Dalai Lama and his staff. And they came back and said it was a great idea. Oh my gosh. All these things make me cry. It's so, cause it's so beautiful. You know, beauty makes you cry. It's so beautiful. It's incredible. I, I got to see these pages in this book and every word and every illustration. You're so talented. Like when I first went to look at it, I was like, I wonder what these illustrations are going to look like. Cause I've seen the comic strip for years it's its own world, what you created. I mean, it's so breathtaking and sweet and right on. And I'm sure he's, it's just, it carries something about illustration that it carries a message even further because it's, we all have that child in us Mm -hmm. and there's a part of us that we really want to be talked to from that place. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. Well, you know, I, I think for me, what, what I'm proud about the book is I think it um, tells his holiness's message in, in a different way. And when you add the pictures and the way the pacing of the book, it forces people to take time. You know, it, slow, it slows you down. I mean, all these words, you know, when it's just words, they're all beautiful and amazing, but, you know, there's a lot of them and you just exactly, keep on. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, but when you add it with art and you, and you only, like in this book, you know, it's usually one, two sentences at the most per page. So you can't help, you know, all those messages, Eckhart Tolle's, the Dalai Lama's, I mean, they're slow. They're talking not to your brain, but, you know, deeper and into your heart. So I think the more we can slow that brain down, the, the better the message, you know, gets to the person. So, you know, with this book, we were trying to reach a new audience in a different way that the, the words really you know each sentence was important and in the Dalai Lama each sentence is important yeah it, it's so true I don't know did you see the the animated short film the boy the mole the fox and the horse do you know this no, work? I, see that. I mean I, I have the book but I haven't seen the film yet no I mean that totally proves everything you just said you know because it's it the words are one thing but the pictures and then the it just won the oscar you know it was i've been watching him make those illustrations for years and 
than to see it become an Oscar winning short film. I mean, you don't need yeah. any of that. I'm just saying this book could definitely be turned into a short film with those like that is it's and it was so wow to me that we've gotten to a place we've awakened enough that they would know that that was worth an Oscar like that we're willing to receive that level of goodness and put it in the mainstream so I don't know I'm just putting it out there who knows but um it, it, it's so true that the there's no doubt that the illustrations just bring it into a different realm um what are some of your favorite passages from the book? I just want to give people a little taste of just oh, maybe sure. a couple of the things about the book that land when all is said and done, like what's one page or one line that really stays on your heart? Well, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read two. We would love uh, that. Yes. Yeah, so this page, he talks about, here I'm quoting, compassion, loving kindness, and altruism are the keys not only to human development, but also to planetary survival. Real change in the world will only come from a change of heart. What I propose is a compassionate revolution. And I think that's what this book is. You know, it's a, it's a, you know, a plea and a cry to that. We, we need to really work on that compassion. And then with compassion, you know, being the guy who draws mutts and spending my life trying to speak for animals, my favorite page in the book is um, where the Dalai Lama speaks when he was a child traveling to his palace, you know, as a, a four-year-old, the thing he remembered most was all the animals he saw on that long journey. And then at the end of that talk, and I draw all the animals, and that was a fun part of the book for me, drawing the animals. Yeah, I imagine. But uh, at the end, he speaks that, you know, unfortunately, you know, most of them don't exist anymore. You know, it's not the same if you did that travel. And there's a drawing where he's kneeling and he says, perhaps one day we will kneel down and ask the animals for forgiveness. And I just think that's so powerful. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> so that, that's my favorite page in the book. Uh, I just, um, I was just telling this story on Friday night. Um, we had a bunch of people over. I'm Jewish. We had a big Shabbat dinner and I would, I had some people over for dinner and I told them that when I first went to Jerusalem, I met this very holy Kabbalist rabbi and his family. And he took me in and I learned with him and lived in the old city and had this incredible experience. I was there for a few years. And I remember one time saying to him, uh, what's the holiest, most spiritual thing I can do while I'm in Jerusalem? And he said, I have something for you, you know, come back in a few hours. Like I'll finish up what I'm doing and I'll tell you. And I was like, no. oh, I was like, oh, this is going to be good. You know? Yes. And this was in the days I think like eat, pray, love was out and everybody was looking for, you know, where's the fountain of youth? What's the holiest thing I can get my hands on? And he said, um, what I want you to do is, um, and we're already like in the old city of Jerusalem, right? So he's like, you're going to go down this little street and then you're going to make a quick little left. And then you're going to go up like three, uh, there's three doors. It's the third door. It's a blue door. I want you to knock on that door. And I'm like, oh my God, what's going to be in this, right? And he says, there's a woman in there. She's a widow. I want you to offer to do her dishes for her. Wow. And I started to cry because I got it. And he goes, you know, the most, you know, the most spiritual thing you can do, <laughs> go help somebody. Wow. And he said it in the most loving way. Wow. And I, I just got it. You wow, know? What, a great, what a great answer. What a great teacher. And it was just like, you hold the key to the greatest riches because the only thing you ever will get is what you give away. Wow. That's it. That's it. And, and you know, that reminds me, here's one in the book where he says, this is my simple religion. There is no need for temples, no need for complicated philosophy. My philosophy is be kind whenever possible and it's always possible. Yeah. It's always possible. Um, one of the meditations I do uh, is like a loving kindness practice, right? And it's just like, you know, kind of um, 
putting your focus on your heart and opening it and like feeling yourself open it even more and now open it more. And you're like, oh my God, I really can. Like it, like, it's like Bob Marley was right. Like you can really open your heart, you know, like this is really something you can cultivate. And as soon as you do, you're the big winner. You're the big winner, right? Because all of a sudden everything on your screen is beauty Mm -hmm. and you're not in lack anymore. And all you have is what to give away. You're an overflow. And it's, why do you think what, cause once we all get in the water, so to speak, we realize how accessible, how easy it is, Mm -hmm. but why do you think having looked at this for so long, are people so far away from what's so close? Why, Why do you think this is so hard for all of us to just let go and open our hearts and live from a state of kindness and compassion? What do you think is so hard or so scary or so foreign for people that they can't access that when it's right there? Is uh, that that's that's a big question for a, a cartoonist? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I I feel the same way. I I feel like the best of me goes on the page when I'm. You know, when I read that Tolle's The Power of Now, you know, the artist in me related to all of it. You know, that I'm, when I when I'm drawing, I'm in the moment. I'm in that that zone of peace and beauty, but. Then the real world slips in, and it's tough to stay in that. It's tough to stay in that zone in the real world, and I don't know what the answer is, but I I know it's doable because I've you know read and met some people who are there. Yeah, I will. The good news is, I feel like it's undeniable that more than ever in history, there's a level of consciousness that's it's palpable, right? And there's a level of darkness that's also palpable, but like 50 years ago, there wasn't a yoga studio on every corner. This this was not a thing, you know, this was not a thing. I was going to say, we we are living in strange times because it seems so dark, but you're right. I mean, underneath that, I think there's a consciousness level and an awareness that is better than it ever was. And it just seems like, you know, the clock's ticking. When are we all going to wake up and, uh, and do the right thing? Yeah, I just was uh, over the weekend um, at the same Shabbat. I was asking my rabbi, whose parents are Holocaust survivors, you know, what do you think about this question, you know, about the darkness and the light and like, what does it all mean? And he was saying something I hadn't heard before, which was like, I guess it's Newton's third law of physics is that for every force, there's an equal force of an opposing mm-hmm. force or whatever. I don't know how to say it. I got to look it up so I could say it as he actually meant it said. But that kind of is what we're talking about, I think. That like, because there's a lot of darkness, there's an equal amount of this like heightened awakening, right? It's like for one, on one side, the pendulum swings one way. There's like this. And so so there, there's a way in which we can see as dark as things are, if you look over here, there's brightness that's never reached this level also. And that's mm-hmm. that's something maybe to just keep focusing on and more of that, just keep focusing on that. And if you focus on it, what will happen? You'll find more of it, right? And you'll let it in. Um, I think one thing people can do is stop watching the news, you know, and just, <laughs> because when you go through your day-to-day actual life, everyone you meet at the bus stop, on the subway, at the restaurants, they're all nice. You know what I mean? Like people want to get along. It's just on the news, it looks really dark, I feel like, so. Um, You're so right, during the last three years, I've taken sabbaticals from the news and I've always been the happiest then, but it always, it always drags me back in. Yeah, I got rid of our TV. Um, I actually got rid of my TV in 2006, but then once I had kids in 2011, you know, they wanted to watch their little shows. But then we got rid of the TVs during the pandemic because it was just a negative yeah. thing. Um, and yeah, and then I also curate my social media like that where I won't follow anything unless it's like sweet things. Cause I just want to, I just, that's all I want to really look at. Cause really I want to stay in a high vibe so I can give that away, you know? Um, well, I, I, I could, I, I'll tell you that, you know, I've been lucky. I've, I've gotten to meet some incredible, you know, Jane Goodall, uh, Eckhart Tolle. I'm, uh, I'm also friends with uh, Byron Katie and Stephen Mitchell. I'm not sure. I if you love know. Byron Katie. She's been on the show. She's on <laughs> another level of human being. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and the thing they all have in common, and I think about it all the time, 
is every one of them is just so positive and optimistic. And then, and when things get dark, I think, well, Jane Goodall could be optimistic. Yeah. And if all, all these people who know so much more than I do, if they, if they could stay optimistic and be positive, and there's so many opportunities to get pessimistic nowadays that I that that always stays with me. That you know that that's probably one. You know, one of the greatest things they have is that they just have optimism, have faith in the planet and the universe. Yeah. Oh, a zillion percent. Byron Katie makes all problems disappear. Yeah. There's no <laughs> problems. None. It's just how you're looking at it. You're just believing something that's not true. She's she's amazing. She's like a Jedi. She's incredible. And it's interesting what you just said, how you narrowed that down to optimism, because Angela Duckworth came on the show and talked about grit and how she wrote this book and did this TED talk, which was very well received on her research that shows that what makes people successful is not intellect or status. It's their grit. It's their resilience. And she said, what's important to know in the research is that what correlates with resilience is optimism, is that the people who are the most successful and the most gritty, because she said, you can't be Jonas Salk if you don't wake up every day and say, I know there's a cure for polio here, you can't be a, re- a cancer, a cancer researcher and not be optimistic because most of the time you're going to hit zeros, right? You're not going to get a winning shot, but because you're optimistic, you will see it through, you will have the resilience and you will make it so. And so she said, the greatest leaders are the most optimistic people because in this doesn't matter what it looks like. JFK was like, we're going to put a man on the moon. When he said that, they didn't even have the technology to, to know what he was saying. They're like, did he really just say that? Like, what, what is he talking about? But we did because he had the optimism and it's the optimism that is the most intoxicating thing. And if you think about his holiness, the Dalai Lama, the, 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 the glow on his face. Oh my God, yeah. It's, it's, it's plus plus, it's all positive, right? Yeah, so, that, that was, that was the toughest thing for me. Like, I'm I'm not a great caricaturist and I'm not a realist, but what I try to do is I try to capture <laughs> feelings and emotion. And with his holiness, just trying to capture that joy and peace in his face was 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 the challenge because uh yeah, as soon as you look at him, you just you feel good inside. Yeah. Yeah. And what I often say, you know, is like that's because he's not um his joy is not coming from the, the outside, right? Mm-hmm. He's not looking around yeah. and therefore deciding that he should be pessimistic or not based on the environment. It's like he projects his own sense of peace and well-being. So he could sit in traffic or he can be in the most beautiful place and he's going to find his, his Zen, you know? Um, and we all can do that. We really can. Like he's evidence of what's possible. You know, he wouldn't want someone to see him as like, oh, well, that's only for you. Like, no, the whole, it's the opposite. And that's the work that you're doing together. So for people who are, you know, living in quote unquote, that real world, which is not as, it's not as real as it seems, but the the world of, of self-doubt, the world of, right. Um, yeah. What's one piece of like encouragement you might have because I think there's a lot of people who doodle or draw and they're afraid to put it in the world because they don't think it's good enough, you know? And as somebody who is so successful, they might look at you and say, well, it's easy for him to say all this because he's so successful. But I'm sure that as you were drawing, you know, at five, 10, 11, you know, 20, you were making messy things until you made more brilliant things. But that took optimism, right? That took courage. So how did you get through those stages and be willing to put out there what you had in the moment before it was perfected? You know, I, I think it's that grit you were talking about and, and, and belief in yourself. Um, I just knew, you know, it's funny. I, I just knew when I was five years old, I was going to be a cartoonist. There wasn't any, I didn't have any doubt. You know, it's just, that's what I was supposed to do. I mean, that the book I did with Jane Goodall called Me Jane. I mean, that was that was Jane. She was a little spunky kid and she knew what she was gonna do. She was going to Africa and, and boy, I mean, her story's incredible because back then little girls weren't supposed to have dreams like that. And she had that dream and damn, no one was gonna stop her. She never had a doubt. You know, she had that grit and that determination. And um, you know, for me, 
Yeah, just believe in yourself, believe in your work. And, and success is a funny thing. I mean, it's, it's great that I've had success, but you know, the real success is becoming a, and helping others and becoming a great person. So I mean, even if your art just makes your, your family laugh, it's still a great thing to do. You know? it's so it's, that's a really good perspective. Did you have encouragement? Did you have one person or two people? What did your parents, what was their yeah. take on it when you said mom and dad, you know, I want to be a cartoonist. What was the encouragement? I, no, I'd say that that's, that's, that was my, uh, you know, real luck was my mom and dad, neither one of them became professional artists, but they actually met at Cooper Union Art School. So they, they loved art. They want, you know, my mom ended up being an art teacher at a vocational school um, and then went on to become a vice principal. But um, art was encouraged in our house. I mean, we were, you know, we had paper and art supplies ever since. So my my two brothers and my sister and I, had to, art was just part of the house. We we all drew and thought it was possible to be a cart you know, to be a cartoonist. It's funny though. When I was in high school, I did have a doubt when it was time to decide what college to go to because I was good in school and I was saying, well, you know, maybe I need to go to a real college and a real get a real job. That I think that lasted about a half a day. <laughs> And then it was like, no, I'm going to be a cartoonist. So uh, there was maybe a half a day of doubt when I was in the height in the senior year in high school. Did your other siblings become artists? You know, they didn't, but any one of them could have been. And they they still all doodle. And um, my one brother plays guitar, so he, he you know he became a musician. Uh, my other brother is in video, so that's an artist. When I think about it, yeah, they were, you know they didn't do the the. Uh, art drawing art but they did music and video and yeah so they all have they all have kind of art jobs so what do you think then about kids in school and the need for more arts and I mean because I know for myself having had this podcast for six and a half years and talked to so many brilliant wonderful people it makes me want to unschool my kids like it makes me only want to put my kids in a room with clay and just say go like you know what do you think about the need for creativity in children or what's your perspective on the way kids traditionally don't have so much access to that? Yeah, not art, art is real important. You know, if you find your personal, you know, again, it's a meditation and you also find your personal voice. So uh, I think that's as important as all the other activities. And the curriculum they get, I, I, the arts are, are just, it's definitely a, an important part of development. You know, yesterday I was taking my daughter to a party. It was a ceramics painting party. She's in kindergarten and we made a wrong turn. So I said, oh, Maddie, mommy made a wrong turn. It's at the other place. You know, we got to turn around. And she said to me, my art teacher said that when you make a mistake in art, you just make something that's accidentally brilliant that's it. it's a different kind of masterpiece is what she said to me and my husband I told him that later he goes you have to write that down that's amazing and I I think that that is why it's so important to have art in your life because every other thing they study they they know what the answer is the teacher's trying to get uh, and in exactly. art that's not the case my God, she, she learned a valuable lesson there for life, for I everything. Know. Forget art just for life. I know. It's amazing. Um, what are you hoping with this newest book? You know, if, if a compassion revolution, let's say like that's the highest bar of what we would hope for. And what's the first thing? Like when somebody finishes reading it, what's one thing that you're hoping changes within them? Well, you know, it's, it's an opportunity to um, remind yourself of what's important. You know, there's, there's so much noise out there with our electronic devices and just all the craziness. But um, I think this book reminds you what's, what's really important. And if you can keep that in your heart and your head, that could be very helpful. Um, you know, uh, the other thing I thought which is a little different than other books by His Holiness is that this, this book's a story and 
you know, Jane Goodall was once asked, how do you, how do you change people's minds? And she said, that's the toughest thing, especially when you're dealing with heads of countries and heads of companies, because they got all the answers in their head. And she said, you can't change their minds, but you could change their hearts. And then they asked, well, how do you change hearts? And she said, you do it with stories. And I just thought that was, you know, the, the great answer. And that's, I think what's nice about this book is that it is a story, you know, the story of a panda coming to his holiness and trying to find some answers. And I, you know, people change their hearts with stories. I mean, that's, that's what we do. We tell stories. That is one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. And because it's not just beautiful, but it rings so true, right? It's like that story I told you where the rabbi told me to go wash the yep. dishes. Yep. Like if I would have tried to tell you some, <laughs> philo some philosophical thing that yeah. he said to me, you'd forget it the next day. Yeah. Because it's not that, it doesn't grab you the same way, but you're right. The, the story of it makes mm -hmm. the point so much better than trying to make the point. And you're right. I think about it now. You think about these people standing up in Congress and they're just all trying to make points and talking over each other. And maybe that would be an amazing thing if they had an assignment to stand up and tell their stories. You know, because yeah. I think Mr. Rogers said, there's nobody who wouldn't love you if they just heard your story. Wow. Isn't right? he? Yeah, Mr. Rogers, he's one of my all time heroes. The best. I mean, yeah. like, you know, it's the same vibration of all these things we're talking <laughs> about. You are like that, Charles Schultz. It's a, it's just a vibration of goodness. It's just peace. It's just sweetness. Right. And um, I love this conversation because it is amazing how, you know, all the time we're trying to be productive, right? We're trying to be successful. That's like for sure in the Western culture, like that's your biggest priority every day is how successful can you be? And mm -hmm. what we've been talking about is what kind of person can you be? And maybe that's the barometer of having the most success, the most joy. And it's so important to just keep that conversation going, especially because putting your ladder on the wall of, I want to be the most successful. Oh, is that an exhaust? That's a never ending ride to more. You just yeah. keep needing more. So in your own life, um, when you're not drawing, what are you doing? How do you spend your time that makes you feel present or at peace? What do you do when you're not drawing? Well, I know this is going to sound crazy, but when you do a daily comic strip and other book projects, I'm drawing. Quite. You're like, actually, that's all I'm doing. <laughs> you know, Charles, Charles Schultz was this, I mean, you know, God bless Charles Schultz. I mean, for how famous he was and how much money he made, he was a daily cartoonist. And that's how he saw himself. You know, he did, it was the work. How know, long does you, it take you to do a daily cartoon? How many, how many moments, how long are you sitting to do one cartoon? Well, you know, I, it's changed over the years. I, I'm at a place now where I, I do batches. I, I do four weeks at it in one sitting. And that sitting is usually a little less than two weeks. So in, in those two weeks, I'm just at the drawing table, you know, getting that work out. And then I have kind of a week and a half off, and that's when I work on the other projects, the other book projects. So I'm pretty much at the drawing table. Other than I walk my dog. Thank God for my dog. See? And then I walk my dog. <laughs> and I, and I, I really like to paint. So uh, my uh, free time, it, it's, still, it's still art. But uh, I, I just do it for myself. I do big, big paintings and I don't have to think about why they're being done or who they're being done for. That's amazing. Is it abstract stuff or is it landscape stuff? What do you think? It started as abstract and now I'm starting to throw a couple of figures in there. So uh, I guess the storyteller in me still wants to tell stories. That's amazing. Do you go somewhere in nature once every few months to like refuel? Is there a special oh, place yeah. you like to go? Where I, do you? Well, you know, even when I do my strip, there, there, there's a beautiful little garden uh, in walking distance from my house. So uh, I take my notebook and I sit in that garden and I don't leave until I have at least two weeks worth of jokes. So uh, I, I, when the weather, you know, when the weather's good and the way the weather is nowadays, it's uh we didn't really get a winter this year so i was able to work, work what part of the what part of the world are you in where do you live i'm in new jersey princeton okay, okay. so yeah it can be really cold for many many months yeah. yeah 
Um, but that's so sweet. I, I also think that's such an, another level of skill. Like, let's not forget, not only are you drawing and sharing compassion and kindness, you have to make it funny. Like, <laughs> yeah. does that ever feel like pressure? Like, how do you, how do you deliver that over and over and over again? What do you, what do you attribute that to? Well, I always say uh, cartoon, daily cartoonists aren't allowed to have writer's block. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with faith. You know, it all comes from the universe. You get, that's why I talk about making arts and meditation. You get in that zone and somehow things come, you know. Um, and sometimes it's corny. Sometimes, you know, the characters write themselves sometimes. You live with these characters for so long. <laughs> You just you put put the cat in a funny situation. He he kind of tells you what he. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is uh, it about? What is it about life that you find most funny? Like, is there something since you were a kid? Like, is it people's behavior? Is there is there a way in which you were always observing people in a in a way that leads you to find things that are funny? You know, I was lucky. I, my my family's funny and my friends were funny. I surrounded myself with funny people. And to this day, the people I'm closest to are usually the people who make me laugh the most. So uh, I think I've always found inspiration. And, and my family, you know, when we have our get-togethers at holidays, you know, everyone's not telling jokes, but just telling stories in funny ways. And it's just like everyone topping each other with just how what kind of jokes you can do. So I was lucky I lived in a an atmosphere where telling funny stories was uh, part of our life. I love that. And I also don't think it's so surprising because I find that people who have the most depth, you know, can also sometimes be the most funny because I think um, not everybody life's like, <laughs> what, what'd you say? That's great because life's funny. Right. And uh, what's that Woody Allen quote? The comedy is tragedy plus time. Right. You know, this is kind of like it's like seeing things, having the ability to see the pain or the frustration in things sometimes gives way to the the, the humor. Right. Anyway, um, I'm so excited for everyone to hear this episode, to go back and, you know, get the books if they haven't already and to um, just keep following along in your journey. Uh, tell everyone where they can follow you and find you is the best place. Your Instagram is the best place. A website. Where's the best place to send people? Um, probably mutts.com it's okay. a website for the comic strip and we do have a landing page for heart to heart his holiness's book um, you also can get the book there and it will be autographed a signed copy um, you also can get the book at your local bookstore so I would always like people to go to their local bookstores too and uh, you know I have an Instagram account I'm not I'm usually drawing. I don't keep it that uh, up to date, but it's uh, there's a few things there to look at. Amazing. And, uh, and I'd also like to mention too that my uh, I've just finished my next book, which is coming out in September. And this is going to sound crazy too, but I, I went from the Dalai Lama to um, I did a graphic novel with the Marvel superheroes. Believe it or not, and uh, it's a Marvel comic book, but it's really a spiritual book in disguise. Oh my gosh, that is so exciting. Well, maybe we'll have you back in the fall to talk about that. <laughs> um, I, would, that's, I, would, I would love it. This has been a great, a great conversation. With you, you are such a delight. You are just, you're like, you give people nutrition just being around you. It's just, it's very fortifying in such a great way. So we'll put a link um, in the podcast notes to all this. So everybody can just click and get the books and follow you at your website and all that stuff. But Thank you so much for being who you are. And Kathy, I have to tell you, this has been very magical because about 15 minutes into this talk, my entire uh, landscaper crew came and they've yet to do anything noisy, which I've, I've been dreading it the whole half hour, looking at them walking around, waiting for the noise. The noise hasn't happened yet. So we, the, the gods were with us today. I think that's true. You gave me so much. Thank you, Patrick. You're such a delight. Uh, likewise, it's the best interview I've ever done. Thank you so oh much. Oh my God. I love everything about you. And I can't wait to go back and get the other books that I don't have. And um, we'll have you back in the fall. That'd be great. Thanks so much. Thank you so much.